Hey everyone, and uh, thanks for tuning in. I'm going to be talking about the formation of the Nika Plateau in northern Malawi and its connection to modern day rifting in the area. And this is part of my PhD project at the University, University of Melbourne. Uh, so what is Nika? Well, it's a large, highly elevated plateau in northern Malawi. And it's also an incredibly beautiful national park that I highly recommend you go to if you're in the area. Uh, looking at the map of Malawi, what's probably immediately apparent to you is the large lake just to the east of Nika, and this is Lake Malawi, and it's forming over the main spreading center of the active Malawi Rift. So just to put things into a more regional context, the Malawi Rift is one of the southernmost and youngest expressions of the East African Rift System, which is a series of rifts that stretch from the Afar Triangle in northeastern corner of Africa, just off the coast of Mozambique, to, to just off the coast of Mozambique. Um, the East African Rift is divided into two separate branches, the eastern and the western branches that diverge around the Tanzanian Craton. Uh, the eastern branch is magmatic, whereas the western branch is largely amagmatic, particularly in the southern half near Malawi. Um, the East African Rift gets younger as you move to south, and the Malawi Rift is currently active and is thought to have initiated around 9 million years, whereas the uh, East African Rift itself is thought to have initiated in the Eocene. What's causing rifting in the area is the movement of Africa across the African superplume. It's just uh, unzipping the African continent from north to south. So zooming back to Malawi and Nika, the tectonic history of the area is complex. And Nika itself is a protozoic granite intrusion belonging to the Umbindian orogeny. Uh, the Paleoproterozoic Urimite orogeny is adjacent to Nika's western border. Along the north, Nika's northeastern edge, the Mugis shear zone establishes the contact between these two mobile belts. And in some areas around the, and bordering Nika, Permo Triassic Karoo sediments outcrop in failed um, Karoo faults and Karoo rift valleys. To the north in Tanzania is the only active, uh, is the only volcanic activity in this half of the East African rift system, as the Rungwe volcanic province. As you can probably tell, the area around Rungwe is uplifted much like Nika is, which is likely plume supported. Uh, the Livingstone Mountains to the northeast are also highly ele elevated, and that's just above the largest rift shoulder of the Malawi Rift. Uh, so the question arises about Nika. Given its proximity to the Malawi Rift and the volcanic province, could they be somehow related? And where, when did the plateau form? So there are two main camps for the development of Nika. Um, that it's a large, or that, that it's an old remnant erosional surface that dates back to Gondwana, or that it's a young feature directly related to recent rifting in Malawi. In the old camp, hematite dating in uh, Dury Crest from Nika was dated to the Permian. However, this was not in situ sample and does not date the form formation of uh, Nika's relief itself. In the young camp, thin lithospheric mantle and low velocity seismic anomalies beneath. Um, the volcanics in the north does seem to persist under Nika, giving rise to the idea that Nika could be, could be plume supported as well. Um, however, Nika's heat flow does not support this, and the seismic anomaly only appears to be in the deepest sections. So whatever Nika lacks in lithosphere, it seems to make up for in its crust. Um, but its proximity to the Malawi Rift has to count for something, right? But by that same token, its proximity to failed Peru's Rift should also count. Uh, so to further investigate this uplift history of Nika, we used uh, appetite fish track data as well as appetite and zircon helium to constrain the uplift history of the upper crust along Nika. Uh, we took about 20 basement samples from the area. Importantly, a few samples were taken from the adjacent Karoo deposition in the north as well as uh, adjacent to Karoo deposition along Nika's uh, southeastern fault. These were taken on the upthrown side of that fault. And this was to constrain Karoo extent and possible fault reactivation. Here's a map showing all of the low temperature data. And I won't go through everything for this presentation, but if you'd like to come back and revisit this slide and pause it, you can do that later. So I'll just quickly focus on the general trend using the fission track data. We found three main age zones. Uh, the first on top of the plateau, uh, the ages are the oldest and seem to indicate relative stability. And the ages then generally get younger towards Nika's edge. 
In the surrounding area, the youngest ages are around 70 million years and occur near the Karoo outcrops. And this general age trend is also true for the Haley Medata. Uh, so for the next few slides, I'm going to show some time slice maps uh, with cooling vectors like this one. Each point represents a time, a time slice on the thermal history models from QTQT using the fission track and as well as helium data for each sample, or the sample had helium data. Uh, so we took the average path and took a time slice. Uh, the arrow, the vector arrow, and indicates if a sample is cooling or heating, and the magnitude uh, of the arrow is the slope of that change in cooling over time. Uh, that number at the base of the arrow indicates the change in temperature during this time period. So starting with the Devonian, most samples indicate cooling. Um, there's not much difference between the samples along the plateau and the samples off the plateau. Uh, it's important to note that this time period was primarily constrained by the zircon helium uh, data, and all the zircon helium ages range from 300 to 400 million years. And some of these samples do not have zircon helium data, so they're less well constrained. That's particularly true with the sample in the southwest and also the samples uh, along the eastern edge. Moving into the Carboniferous is very similar to the Devonian. However, the overall magnitude of cooling has drastically increased. In the Permian, most samples show cooling, but it seems to be prim primarily confined to Nika's western half. Um, this could be related to Karoo rifting in the, in the failed rift just to the west of the area in Zambia, um, or it could be related to that western bounding fault, some reactivation in the Karoo times. Moving into the Triassic, what is immediately apparent is the large reheating shown in the sample directly in the, to the north, uh, directly adjacent to the Karoo deposition. We used the, the Karoo uh, deposition at that time as a, a surface constraint. Uh, the sample along the plateau did not show this reheating period. With about 50 de degrees of reheating, even used a high geothermal gradient, as soon as we've lost at least a kilometer of Karoo section. And here's an idea of what an extra kilometer of Karoo would have looked like in the area. Uh, Nika may have been blanketed by Karoo. However, it was obviously not enough to affect the low temperature data, uh, meaning that there is likely relief contrast between Nika and the surrounding area at this time. As mentioned earlier, the Permian dairy crust from Nika was sampled from this location, and the authors think it could be recycled Karoo section, which would fit with more extensive Karoo coverage in the area. So continuing on to the Jurassic, things are relatively stable. In the, uh, in the Cretaceous, the two samples along the foot wall to the southeast are better constrained at this time and prefer a cooling. And this could be due to removal of the Karoo cover in that area. And similarly, the northern sample adjacent to the Karoo deposition also prefers cooling at this time to the, a similar degree. Uh, the Paleocene is relatively stable. Some areas show moderate cooling. And finally, in the Neogene, there's widespread cooling on both on and off the plateau. And this is likely due to the reactivation of weakened fabrics and regional uplift of the Malawi Rift in the nearby area. So to revisit our two theories, where does this new data fit? Uh, well, it's kind of a, a bit of the both worlds. So there's evidence for cooling of the Devonian and Carboniferous. However, that's poorly constrained by the Devonian zircon ages and the few samples that have uh, zircon ages. So given that the plateau shows little to no influence of the widespread Karoo deposition during the promo triassic as seen in that northern sample off the plateau, uh, leads us to suspect that the plateau was uplifted by at least this time. In the young camp, there's obvious neogene cooling, which are likely related to the modern day rifting. However, this is a regional feature and is not confined to the plateau itself. So overall, the data suggests the sample is cooled to near surface in the Cenozoic and does not support the theory of a Gondwana surface. So to summarize a summary, uh, Nika was likely elevated by the Paleozoic to early Mesozoic, but the current surface is Cenozoic. Uh, just to flash these references for anyone that's interested. And uh, thank you very much for listening.